order to gain access to their citizenship rights. Watch this weekend on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. Good evening. Good evening. I'm, I'm Bradley Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and on behalf of everybody at Politics and Prose and the staff here at, at George Washington University, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. You know, you know uh, we, we at, at Politics and Prose have been working with the folks here at Lisner for a number of years now and um, uh, putting on large events like, like the one this evening. And we're very, very grateful to be able to have access to such a, a spacious and convenient facility uh, right here in, uh, in the center of Washington. Well, it's certainly been a, a day of, of high drama. <laughs> We've had... Uh, all too many dramatic days over the past couple of years, but as history looks back, today's Senate Judiciary Committee hearing will no doubt stand out as a truly extraordinary event. Uh, if you're like me, uh, many of you are still processing the testimony of Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh, and certainly our featured author this evening, Bob Woodward, will have some of his own thoughts to share about the Kavanaugh nomination in the context of the Trump presidency, which his new book, Fear, portrays in such devastating detail. Bob has been observing and reporting on major developments in Washington for nearly half a century. Working for the Washington Post, he's covered nine presidents. He has shared in two Pulitzer Prizes, first for the Post's coverage of the Watergate scandal, and second in 2003 as the lead reporter for coverage uh, of the 9-11 attacks. Fear is Bob's 19th book. All have been national bestsellers. And Fear marks Bob's 13th book at the top of the bestseller list. I think he holds the record for the most number one nonfiction bestsellers of any author. Now each time one of his revelatory books appears, the question comes up, how does he get people to talk to him? Why do people agree to share their stories with him? I suppose everyone who confides in Bob has his or her own reason, uh, but one thing I know, as a former colleague of his at the Washington Post, who has on occasion reported in Bob's wake, one thing I know is how hard Bob prepares and how hard he pushes and probes. He's methodical and relentless, fastidious about facts, and hell-bent on obtaining documents whenever he can get his hands on them to verify whether something did or didn't happen. Let me uh, just say, too, uh, again, as a former colleague of Bob's, uh, that Bob can be truly generous with his time and his advice. Many of us at The Post have been grateful he's remained on the staff uh, as an associate editor, contributing to the paper and coaching other reporters when he could have chosen a number of other career paths. Bob will be in conversation here this evening with another first-rate journalist, Michael Schmidt. Uh, Michael's with the New York Times, and he, and he started there as a news clerk 13 years ago and now covers national security and federal law enforcement. He was part of two teams that won Pulitzer Prizes this year, one for reporting on workplace sexual harassment issues and the other for coverage of Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election and Russia's connection to the Trump campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, both Bob and Michael. the nicest anyone's been, and certainly to me in a long time, even though they're cheering for you. Um, 
obviously um, a long day. Um, everyone in Washington glued to the testimony. You've written a book about the Supreme Court several years ago. How did today compare to previous hearings like this, contentious ones? Uh, obviously, this is uh, quite electric. What uh, happened, uh, did the book The Brethren with Scott Armstrong, and uh, this book came out in 1979. Were you born? <laughs> It didn't come out in 79, okay. did it? I'll send you a copy. <laughs> and uh, the conclusion in the book at the end, and it, it supported, is that the center of the court was in control, a group of three or four justices. How they went, uh, the left or the right would join with them. I mean, now, obviously, uh, there is no center or very a very small center, so that makes a big difference. Uh, on the Kavanaugh issue, uh, let me tell a story about doing the uh, book, The Brethren. The book came out, and this is, this is a, a story about memory, which I think is very important to the Kavanaugh issues. A, uh, the book came out, and a clerk called Scott Armstrong and myself and said, in the book, on a certain case, you say that the clerk apologized for, uh, it was uh, Justice Rehnquist's circulation at that point. And he said, I was the clerk. That is absolutely, totally wrong. Uh, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to hang you out to dry. I am, you know, everything you might possibly do to someone, you have to correct uh, what's there. So we went to our files, and this is the beauty, as you know, of documents. And we found in the files on that case, the circulation in that opinion, and the clerk in his own hand had written, I'm sending this around, I apologize <laughs> for it. So we called him and said, here's what you wrote. And he said, I, I don't believe it. We made Xerox and sent it to him. And he called back and I think quite honestly said, I would have staked my children's life that that did not happen. And I now realize that it did. So when is memory valid? And uh, as you know, in your terrific reporting, You've got to, one source doesn't work. You've got to have two sources. You have to see if you can get some sort of documentation. And that takes time and that's hard. Did, um, was the contentiousness today, how did that compare to Bork or how did that compare to Thomas? And is it different because of the media? What, what's, what's interesting, uh, the, the Democrats are particularly saying we've got to have an FBI investigation. And they talk as if FBI investigations reach conclusions, which has been pointed out they normally don't. But sometimes the evidence is so overwhelming, it's implied in what they report. But going back to the Nixon case in Watergate, the FBI investigation was part of the cover-up. And uh, it was a way to mask and protect Nixon and protect people in the Nixon campaign and the White House and the Attorney General at the time. I remember this uh, very well. Richard Kleindienst went on television and said, well, we conducted 1,345 interviews all over the world. We, we got it right, it's over, no one else was involved than the original burglars and, and their two handlers. And uh, there was that sense of, well, wait a minute, that's a lot of interviews, a lot of work, and they got it wrong. So maybe an F, so it's not always definitive and it may not always be right. Um, I'm sure everyone here has seen the, the book on an enormous amount of attention. And the thing that struck me the most about the book was that I thought that you drew 
conclusions in a way that you may not have in previous books. You were very critical of how Comey handled his interactions with the president um, when he briefed him on the, the dossier. And then your largest conclusion was the fact- right. Can you imagine you're two weeks away from becoming president and the FBI director comes in and there's no way the ghost of J. Edgar Hoover is not far behind and says, by the way, we have this secret dossier about you being with prostitutes in Moscow three years earlier. How would you feel? Well, how should Comey have handled it? <laughs> <laughs> not that way. Well, 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 and and uh, Trump has a legitimate beef, in my view, and, and I say so in the book. And uh, being the prisoner of too much history and writing uh, too much about presidents, uh, in the case of Bill Clinton, when he came into office in 1993, and uh, his White House counsel was Bernie Nussbaum. And, uh, first of like six. Yes, that's right, but, but the, the first. And uh, uh, as you imagine, uh, Clinton had some baggage too, and there were all kinds of things that the FBI got about Clinton's extracurricular activities, which were abundant, and so they sent all this Instead of briefing Clinton on it, they sent it to Bernie Nussbaum, the White House counsel. And Nussbaum looked at it and said, hmm, put it in the burn bag. And said, okay, let's see what happens. Let's see how these things. And I, I'm not sure the burn bag is, I wish he'd called me. Or, uh, and uh, he didn't, but the idea of the FBI director getting in the face of uh, somebody like Trump who has a big ego, has a, and he, uh, I quote in the book, he, Clinton told his lawyer when he was, uh, after this briefing, he, he said, oh, Melania can never find out about this. Of course, it was about two minutes or two days later she did, as did the world. Yeah. And you draw a conclusion that the administration is in a very dangerous spot. Yeah. And I felt that that is the, f is that the furthest you have ever gone? And why did you go so far? Uh, Evelyn Duffy, who's my assistant. I, are you here, Evelyn? Uh, uh, raise your hand. Evelyn, stand up. Because... <laughs> A George Washington University graduate, a class of, yes. And uh, the year 2007, uh, she's worked for me since, actually, at that time, and we've done five books, four presidents, and uh, she knows all the secrets. <laughs> and she knows how to keep secrets, and she knows how to kick me in the ass. And uh, for that, I salute her and GW. <laughs> but, but Evelyn and my wife, uh, Elsa Walsh, uh, very much involved. This was a family affair. And uh, they both said, you cannot step away from the obvious conclusions of what you found in the book that there is, there are a group of people, which I illustrate very vividly, who stand up to Trump, uh, steal documents off his desk uh, on South Korean trade, because it's connected to lots of very sensitive intelligence operations, uh, documents on NAFTA, uh, documents on climate change, and so forth. It's a regular procedure get it off the resolute desk and he will not remember or not think about it. And as I say, so, and, and you've got all of the other things, John Dowd, his lawyer uh, for the Russian investigation for eight months. Can you imagine being Trump's lawyer, eight months? <laughs> and uh, he goes through and he finally does a practice session with, uh, with Trump and, and uh, in the White House, and they're overlooking the 
monuments and Dowd, the lawyer, plays Mueller and asks questions of Trump. It's kind of a dry run and, and Trump makes things up, lies, uh, loses emotional control and finally Dowd says, you cannot testify. Uh, if you testify, it will be, as he elegantly puts it, an orange jumpsuit. Uh, and you don't have to know a lot about law enforcement to uh, not recognize what that is. And so you connect all of these things, and my conclusion in the book is that it is an administration in a White House that's going through a nervous breakdown. So it's going through a nervous breakdown. How could it go wrong? What would a manifestation of that look like? Is it something on the trade or economic side? Is it, give us an example of, okay, it's in a dangerous spot. What could happen? Uh, just on trade, and it sounds esoteric, but uh, the, the trade war with China, 99.9% uh, .9 of the economists uh, say uh, tariffs make no sense, they hurt consumers. Uh, we buy things abroad in this country because they're cheaper and they're better quality. And uh, Trump somehow has in his head that we're, they're taking that money from us, they're stealing it. And he will not get that out of his head. And uh, one of the conclusions I make is that this, there's a war on truth. And part of it is not just what Trump says, but what, where Trump gets these ideas and uh, the experts go in and that, you know, they have to, I mean, Gary Cohen, his chief ec economic advisor, is kind of sl slaps him gently in an affectionate, perhaps, way and says, uh, if uh, you'd shut the fuck up, you would learn something. <laughs> So you, you've got to connect it, but I, I, I think it's, uh, and I, it's not partisan. This isn't uh, partisan. I mean, I, may I ask you a question? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Will you me. answer? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Do you, I mean, you, you've done great reporting, great digging reporting on uh, the Mueller investigation, and lots of new information has come uh, largely uh, through you, quite frankly. And do you consider yourself part of the resistance? No, not at all. What are you then? I'm um, simply out to follow the story wherever it goes, no you, matter whether it's good, bad, or otherwise for either side. Suppose Mueller uh, goes on for several more months and says, you know, I can't prove collusion with Russia by Trump or anyone in a close, somebody close to him, and that there's no obstruction of justice I can prove. Are you gonna feel badly? No. What are you gonna feel? I'm um, gonna try and find out why he didn't get to that conclusion. You think that's possible he would reach that conclusion? Very possible. You do? As, as possible as any, as the other possibility. Yeah, that he would. And so how do you insulate yourself emotionally? <laughs> and we should have had a couple of couches here rather than <laughs> chairs. So three times a week I see my therapist. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just simply say that like, I try and divorce myself as much as possible. I didn't vote in 16. I didn't vote in 12, and that, for me, enabled me to push myself away and say, okay, I'm sort of an outsider to this. I'm sort of like, it's like you kind of look up, you're, and I look at it like trying to cover the weather. It's like there's a big storm in front of you, and I'm trying to see different parts of it, and I can't really affect the weather, and it's not my job to affect the weather. It's just my job to try and figure out the weather and just try and follow it where it can. Yeah. And... Uh, when, uh, right after Nixon resigned in 1974, Catherine Graham, who was the publisher owner of, of the Washington Post, sent Carl Bernstein 
and myself a letter and kind of, uh, it, it was a lovely letter of personal advice. And she said, you know, now this has happened, uh, Nixon's gone, uh, don't get too full of yourself. And then she said, beware the demon pomposity. And that was really good advice because there's a lot of pomposity in our business, in politics, even academia, academia occasionally. Uh, and it is, the, it is the crippling force, I think. And you have to really try to bleach out. I love your analogy, it's the weather. And you, you, know, you can get up and kind of say an awful storm is coming, but that doesn't mean you're blaming the creator or it means you're reporting. And I think there's a way to stay on this side of the non-resistance and to be very empirical and very factual. And uh, because I, I, I've done this uh, so many years, sometimes you're just wrong. You're, I, I thought the Ford pardon of, of uh, Nixon uh, was really the last stage of the cover-up, and then I investigated and discovered actually it was an act of courage to let the country move on. And so that's very sobering. I think one thing that I had always keep in the front of my mind, and especially with the time pressures that, that I'm under, is that I'm always one step from the gutter. I'm always one bad tweet away from destroying my reputation. I'm always one you know, wrong story away from hurting myself. And it, you know, it's just, it's, it can be tough. But not only yourself, the New York Times. Yeah. And uh, this is where you've got to find, I mean, Bradley, the great editor of the uh, Post during Watergate and for a couple of decades, used to, I, I so well remember this, hand in a story and he'd look at it and he'd go, you don't have it yet. That meant we'll print it if you do get it, but you've got to have more information and more sources. And I always said and believed he was a great editor, not just because of what he published, but what he kept out. Yeah. I, I, it, are there those filters at the New York Times for you? Th there's a lot of time where we run up to write a story where we, we get ready, we write it, we go to folks to get a response, and then in that last 12 hours, we realize we don't have it, and then we kind of recede back. We wrote a story earlier this year on Trump, uh, on John Dowd, offering pardons, talking about pardons to the lawyers for Manafort and Flynn. And we ran up to the line three times. It was kind of like, you know, like a goal line stand, and we're three yards out. We tr first down, we tried, and we didn't have it, and we pulled it, and we didn't run it. Second time, and then the third. But in that process, you flush out a lot of different. And you did things. run and it, you f and when eventually we broke. And he through. still denies it. Correct. He? he still denies. He de denies a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> he denies and a lot of things. Um, how did um, did you think the president was well served by John Dowd and John Dowd's tenure? John Dowd, who left in March. You know, the, it's an interesting question. Uh, some people think definitely not by turning all over all the evidence over and 37 witnesses and who's the uh, 17 hours of tape of Don McGahn's uh, notes, uh, notes uh, which are supposedly very intimate and very important. Uh, and then other people say, you know, it, it was a gamble and you had to take it if you're Trump's lawyer because you have to keep him from testifying. And if he testifies, that would be the legal and political catastrophe. Do you agree? If he testifies? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, he struggles with the truth more than any public figure right now. So, so how do we deal with that? Is well, and especially because Mueller has shown a very quick trigger on that issue. So he's rung up several folks on lying to investigators. Some of the things 
significant, some less so. And the president is not someone obsessed with the facts. So what are the... <laughs> so what are the techniques you use as a reporter to get verification? Because I think that's very... I think that's something we don't communicate to the public enough about that... Can you answer that without betraying trade no, craft? No, it's, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of factors. One of them is your proximity to the information. How close are you to the information? How historically helpful and accurate have you been? There are people that are in the room that are amidst all these big decisions that, that bat, they don't bat a thousand. They don't have great memory of what goes on in front of them. They don't have great notes. They don't have great documents. Um, and you sort of look at the totality of all of these different things. We had this recently with the Rod Rosenstein story about how Rod Rosenstein had talked about wiring himself up or using the 25th Amendment to oust the president. In the end, it fell into sort of two buckets of information. There was months and months of reporting that from folks that had access to contemporaneous notes, that had access to folks that were in the room, that knew everything that was going on in real time, and that had a track record of being accurate and being truthful. And then in the other bucket, we had one person who was a handout from the Justice Department, who was an anonymous person, who said it was sarcastic. So we step back and you look at them, and you look at the totality. And you know, how did you do that? How did you get past that in the book? Yeah, that's. What um, I have found over doing this for decades and all these presidents, you, you can hear something, you can say, well, there's, uh, like, I knew from all kinds of people, there's great tension between H.R. Uh, McMaster, who was the National Security Advisor, and Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, and they really had it out. And somebody said there was a meeting in, in the summer and they, they had a big fight about it. And then uh, I found somebody who actually took notes. And the notes uh, say, Tuesday, January 18th, 5.15, Reince Priebus's office, the chief of staff at the time. And then there are verbatims. And it turns out that Priebus was doing a kind of a routine review with Tillerson, are you achieving your big goals? And in walks McMaster to the meeting and sits down. And uh, Tillerson lets loose on the White House. The, the, you know, the president can't make a decision. He makes a decision. He undecides. He redecides. There's chaos here. And then finally, McMaster just lash rages at Tillerson and says, you know, I mean, the money line is you are affirmatively acting to undermine the national security process. I don't know what you're doing. And I've, I found some examples and Evelyn uh, found that, oh yeah, one of these examples is clearly in the public record that Tillerson had made a, a uh, anti-terrorist agreement that was public with uh, the oil-rich state of Gutter, and uh, he, McMaster didn't know about it, and they start talking about it, and they realize Tillerson actually had a press conference in Gutter saying, we've been working on this for weeks, and McMaster says, you know, I did not even know, and then they discover the president didn't know. The staff secretary, Rob Porter, didn't know. And so you, you put dates and documents and verbatims, and I, I always am suspicious uh, when somebody says, one afternoon in May. Well, what day in May? What, what time? Who was there? What was said? And if you can get that kind of granularity now, it, I have the luxury of time to work on these things and go back and find sources who, who have notes and, and documents, which I think are much more important than we realize. Um, we're gonna take questions if, 
folks would like to line up, there, might, there are two microphones in the back. Um, you want to tell them the microphones have been provided by Gordon Liddy. <laughs> See, I mean, how do people who are in college know who Gordon Liddy is? When, when you, um, you put out this book, enormous amount of attention, certain things like taking the, the letter uh, off the desk gets a lot of attention. What telling reporting did you do that you felt really, sometimes we do this, we do great reporting, and it doesn't get as much attention, and people sort of miss. And you said, man, you know, I killed myself to do that, and it kind of fell flat. Yeah, uh, but what there was a rationale for doing it, and because at risk was a special access program, one of the great secret intelligence operations that I, I don't, do not dare describe because it buys a degree of security for this country that we don't realize. And then I actually got the document and got a picture of it and put it in the book. So if somebody like President Trump said, oh, if that had happened, I would have fired Gary Cohen, who had done it in two seconds. But, you know, there it is. And uh, so there is a kind of, uh, you, you can't get around that. You can't get around some of the things. but. Uh, we, you know, there is this war of truth going on, and you, some of your best st stories that I know are true uh, have been denied, and sometimes the stronger the denial is, the more truth that's there. And like the Rosenstein, Rosenstein story about uh, talking about wiring himself or somebody to get the president on tape and talking about the 25th Amendment, that story would have been much more powerful if there was action that followed. If you've kind of said, had a picture in the New York Times, here is the wire that the deputy attorney general uh, wore in the meeting with the president, or at 2.15 on this day, these cabinet officers got together and talked about the 25th Amendment. So lots of things are said. In the end, it's what's done. And I tried to make this a book about what President Trump does as president in all the foreign policy areas, all uh, the trade, the tax areas, the things that matter to people's lives. Uh, if there's been a lot of focus on the Mueller investigation for very good reason. There's been a lot of focus on all the untruths that Trump tells. I mean, my paper has counted, what, 4,000 or 2,000? I don't know. A lot. It's in the thousands. And uh, the real issue is, and Evelyn and my wife Elsa helped me with this, well, what did he do as president? Is there a theme to the president's decision making? Uh, it, it, uh, it often is, uh, people will say, you know, these are the facts. We win 85.7% of our cases in, in the World Trade Organization where we file unfair trade practices against country, countries. And the, President that's the worst organization in the world. And they say, well, this is your government, your uh, trade representative, Lighthizer. Call him and check the number. I don't want to call. I don't want to know. And often uh, he will say, I mean, there, there's one scene that's startling. They, they ask, where do, where do you get these ideas? He said, well, I've had them for 30 years. And if you disagree, you're wrong. And so there is the that's the, same. Uh, the closed mind, which of course leads you to the question: What what should we really worry about? We should worry about a crisis, something unexpected, because it's not a team. Uh, first question. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Woodward, 
Uh, thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. It's a tremendous honor to be able to see you. My name is Elliot Bell Krauser, and I'm a proud uh, GW Colonial uh, Class of 2008 from uh, the uh, Columbian College, Poli Sci. Um, when you and Mr. Bernstein were covering President Nixon and the Watergate investigation in 1973 and 74, you and the um, Washington Post and other newspapers faced threats and, uh, you know, um, things that I can't even imagine in today, but today it seems that the free press is under assault worse than ever. How, in your opinion, does what happened to you and the Post and other journalists in 1973-74 compare to what is happening today? I'm sorry, what's the question? I bet there's so an echo. How the, the criticisms of the press when you were covering Watergate, how does that compare to the criticisms of today? Uh, well, uh, Nixon uh, and his spokespeople were pretty tough. We were called character assassins. And uh, I, I, the original it, fake news? Yeah, but you know, I'd rather be called fake news than a character assassin. I'm sorry, I'm the, I, neither. But uh, if, uh, answer the question this way. It was uh, January 1973, Carl and I had written these stories that really let, said Watergate was a Nixon White House re-election campaign operation. And the key was that it wasn't just the Watergate burglary, it was a series of sabotage and espionage uh, operations. And uh, we had a bit of a problem. No one believed the stories. Uh, Nixon won a massive re-election uh, in November of 72, so Catherine Graham invited me for lunch in uh, January of 73, and she'd supported the story, and I knew her a little bit, but not well, and uh, Carl had to go to a funeral that day, and so she sat down at her, in her lunchroom and uh, said, well, uh, and she truly blew my mind with how she knew the facts of Watergate, had all kinds of questions. Uh, she even at one point said she'd read, uh, read something about Watergate in the Chicago Tribune. And I remember thinking, what the hell is she reading the Chicago Tribune for? <laughs> no one in Chicago does. But there she was, scooping up the information and uh, had a leadership style I later described as mind on, hands off. Didn't tell us how to do things, but was intellectually uh, involved and completely informed. And uh, she said at one point, well, when's the truth going to come out? And I said, you know, I think uh, because the cover-up is very effective, because people won't talk to us now that Nixon has won re-election, uh, because they pay paying the five Watergate burglars for their silence uh, never and she I remember she just Was had this pained wounded look on her face any of your bosses at the New York Times ever have that look sometimes Yeah, it, it, it's you hate it uh, and uh, she said I, and uh, I said, so the answer is, it's never going to come out. And she said, quote, never? Don't tell me never. And I left the lunch a highly motivated employee. But it wasn't a threat. It was a statement of purpose. And she, I mean, this is the strength of real gutsy leadership in the news media. And, and, and she said to me, she said, why do you think we're doing this? And I, I was 29, I didn't have an answer. And she said, look, uh, this involves the President of the United States. We have a triple, quadruple responsibility to get to the bottom of it. So keep working instead of uh, pulling back, go forward more aggressively and and why do we do this? And again, you know, I, I don't have an answer. And and she gave the great answer, because that's the business we're in, and that's you know somebody really saying, ah, 
willing to assume the risk, uh, the necessity of assuming that risk. Question? Uh, we've got a Post guy and a Times guy there, and I'd like to know what the Post guy thinks of the New York Times anonymous um, uh, editorial or op-ed or whatever it was, and um, what he thinks of the substance, and secondly, what he thinks of publishing an anonymous uh, okay. piece like that. It's a great question. Let's let Michael answer first. <laughs> Suppose anonymous, uh, somebody in a well-placed position in the New York Times said, I want you to write a story quoting me, essentially saying what's in that op-ed piece. What would you have done? We would need many more details and examples. 5-15, July 18th. Specifics. Yes, yeah, specifics. And how would you have gone about that? You would have, I would have pushed them, questioned them, and then asked if they have anything to corroborate what they're saying. Yeah. Because it's easy to sit and say, you know, this administration's a mess, but it's much more powerful to show an example of it. Like, your book is filled with them. If Anonymous had come to me, I would have said, go to the New York Times. Uh, Mr. Woodward, thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I feel like you're the most qualified person on the planet who can answer this question for me. The, the great journalist of another era, Upton Sinclair, said, you can't make somebody understand something if their salary depends upon them not understanding it. How do you get truth from someone who genuinely believes the delusion that they're buying into, and you need to get truth from them, but they just can't accept truth? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, this sounds like a uh, philosophy 523 at GW. Uh, uh, you know, what, uh, you, you want to deal in concrete things, and uh, let me answer it this way. Can we do a little role playing sure. here? I'm a reporter, I'm me. You're the Assistant Secretary of Defense, and I've come to interview you. Now, what's going through your head? Um, why is he here? What is he going to ask me? Where am I vulnerable? Vulnerable. And maybe the truth makes you, where am make I, you vulnerable. Where am I vulnerable okay. personally, and where is the administration potentially? So I'm going to come in, and I'm going to start asking you things, and then I'm going to get out a piece of paper, and I'm going to say, Mr. Assistant Secretary, uh, in an article in Defense News 32 years ago, you wrote the following, and I'm going to quote it. And you might think, I thought only my mother read that damn article. <laughs> and here's this guy coming in, quote it. Now, it's not a ruse. I want to know how you think. The larger theory of the case is to treat you as seriously as you treat yourself, as you look at yourself. You take yourself seriously, right? Yeah. I have to take yourself ser you seriously. And really, I'm getting that detail. And then if you're helpful, I'm going to say, can I come back? And then uh, after two or three interviews, if it's useful, I'm going to say, you know, how about talking next week? Well, I'm busy next week, and then I find out where you live, and I come knocking on your door, right? And then I say, oh shit, Bob Woodward's here. <laughs> right. And do you let me in? Probably. Why? I don't know. It's hard to turn people away. Yeah. I think, it's hard, I think it's hard for people to turn away other people. Yes. I think it's harder than people. And I, my line on this is we're not showing up enough. And uh, we've got to really show up, and it means physical presence. We're doing, uh, you know, people will crowd around the uh, 
computer and say, oh, we've asked the White House for comment on, and you know, three people over at the White House are saying, how can we respond to this and not say anything of substance? And you gotta get out of that mode. And you have to get out of the impatience and speed mode. We gotta have this. It's so competitive. I mean, you read, I suspect, I hope, the Washington Post as soon as it comes out each night and it's kind of a continuum. And what, do you like it when the Post has a good story or no, not? I don't like it at all. You don't? <laughs> yeah. Not at all? Not at all, uh, well. Actually. <laughs> This, rem this reminds me of something that I recently read in a book. What did you do after Cy Hirsch in early 1973, who, Cy Hirsch, who came down for the Times to cover Watergate? You, you, Nixon had been reelected. It's that same period of time where you go out to lunch with Catherine Graham. What did you do after Cy Hirsch wrote a story in the Times? What was the story? That was really, was the story about the Watergate burglars being paid. I called him up and said, thank you. Why? Well, because we were alone. And it was, a, it was a key piece of evidence to the cover-up that they would pay actual money to, uh, for family support and lawyer's fees and so forth. It was a stunning story. The other side of it was I felt agony that we did not have that story. But it was such a good story, and it, um, it really lifted our spirits. Well, it validated, it showed another experienced reporter sort of on the same path, right? In a good way. Yeah, and, and not buying the line. Of course, the line then, 45 years ago, was very much what we hear now. Uh, let's examine the conduct of the press, not the conduct of the president. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, my name's Ethan Moran, and I'm currently a 10th grader at Sandy Spring Friends School. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Woodward, you've had one of the most successful careers in journalism in American history, and I was wondering how uh, a high schooler like myself would go about uh, following a career like yourself in journalism or politics. Uh, get an internship at the New York Times. <laughs> the, they're really easy to get. <laughs> I, isn't that the way you started? I started answering the phones. They wouldn't even let me be an intern. They would. <laughs> no, I had to start answering the phones. And I, how did you move up? I mean, this is... Um, so I started at the Times um, at a college as a clerk on the, copy, on the foreign desk and it was my job to do two things. One was to get reporters in Iraq, in the Middle East, on the phone with editors at the New York Times who don't know how to dial their own phone. <laughs> um, and the other one was to take calls from Judy Miller from jail, because the only number she remembered was the foreign desk. Um, but just being in the newsroom gave me an enormous opportunity, and I basically said, I will take any assignment possible. I, will co I covered murders in the Bronx, and I eventually got a break in sports by doing Steinbrenner duty, by standing outside Yankee Stadium and getting a quote from George Steinbrenner. So I did a lot of low-end things that no one wanted to do because I knew that they could lead to other things down the line. And I think if you take that attitude, you can really go for it. And get your foot in the door. Yeah, you got to get in. The fact got, that I was in know, the door. And uh, the, just real quickly, I th um, Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, uh, the Amazon CEO, uh, I asked him once, said, how do you decide who to hire? Because this ha applies to your question. And he said, well, quickly, he said, I have four criteria. Uh, I like people who've been right a lot. I like people who listen, really listen, not strategic listening, where you know, you're listening so you can think of what you're gonna say rather than letting it come in. People, he likes to hire people who change their mind. 
I think that's important. And then his fourth criteria was most fascinating. He said, I like to hire people who have failed and are still standing, that you learn from failure and you can't fail and be gone, you gotta still stand and then Bezos will hire you. <laughs> Next question. Will we ever see Donald Trump's tax returns? <laughs> Between now and the end of time, yes. Um, well, maybe not. Sometimes, you know, they never come out. Uh, I think in terms of uh, really getting, uh, traveling that painful road of introspection, I think it's uh, one of the media's failures. I think personally my failure, because I was working on his tax returns in 2016 and we did not get them, I did not get them. And we should have, because people in the IRS have said very confidential, in a very confidential way, if you had these, this is the roadmap to his life and who he is. And uh, I think also we did not find, or the political system didn't find a way to demand that he turn over his tax returns. He just said no, and of course, uh, that's the Trump, you know, I'm gonna do it my way. One of, of the failures, and I think if you ask a, a, a group like this, uh, it, how many people basically distrust the media? Can I ask the, how many people basically distrust the media? Raise your hands. Okay, not many. You can tell it's a college uh, audience, uh, but you can go to an audience and, and get 90% of the people who will say they distrust the media. And so there's enough distrust out there and uh, whether it's 20 or 30% or what, it's too high and we can't blame the customers. We've got to think about fixing it ourselves and being more empirical, being no, you know, getting on TV I think is a dangerous, have you found that? Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, you say things on TV that you won't put in your stories. Well, I shouldn't. Do should. you? No, did you ask me or did you say I did? Either no. way. No, I try not to say, <laughs> I try not to say anything on television that I, ha that I haven't written. One of your editors told me they heard you say something on television and they said, why wasn't that in the story? <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah, but you think TV for print journalists at my paper, your paper, a good thing? I think that it's another way to reach folks, and I think that when people see us and they see that we're fact-based people that are trying to tell a story, I think that that can be helpful, I do. And I think that we need to be out there more explaining our work and showing ourselves because when we're just a byline and there's not much more than other things can fester about us. And it's got to be, it can be tough, but it's got to be neutral. Uh, Hugh Hewitt, who, a conservative uh, radio talk show host, I went on his show and he said, of, he found things in my book that actually made Trump look strong. And he liked that and he said, I'm going to buy lots of the books and airdrop them into every embassy in Washington. That'd be a lot of books. I, I gave him the address where he can <laughs> buy them at a discount, but I don't think he ever did it. But I quite honestly was heartened by somebody like that saying, oh, there are things here. And also the explanatory part of how Trump... Well, because it decides. shows that it's fair. It's a fair assessment. It's tough though. When, when Trump last month called me to complain that uh, I hadn't interviewed him. And uh, first thing I said, I'd like to tape record this, uh, Mr. President, and he said, certainly. And then uh, I said I'd tried six people and uh, didn't get through, and he acknowledged one or two, and it, w it was a strength. Did you read this? What did you think of that? Well, what would you have asked him if you could have interviewed him? But if I asked a question, yeah. 
the book was already printed. And what do we do? Have a kind of uh, pamphlet that we stick in in the back <laughs> and kind of say, well, Trump called and I, I, I looked at it as I had the. No, but if you really could have, if you did quiet. sit, if you had sat down with him, what would you have asked him? I mean, ultimately, you want to get to specifics, but you want to ask the question, why? What is, what is the big theory? Why, what are you trying to do? What's the next stage of good for a majority of people in the country? That's your constituency. Um, we have to wrap things up, but I wanted to end it by having you read the last paragraph of the book, which I think is a great summary, um, sort of, of what you had found. And um, it's just a good way to sort of end things. Well, Evelyn wrote this paragraph. <laughs> no, she did not, but she helped me, as did uh, Elsa. But uh, this is about Dowd, the lawyer, who has resigned because he just said, I cannot sit sit next to you, Mr. President, and have you destroy yourself and not tell the truth. And he said, you're incapable of telling the truth. You're disabled. So this is doubt. But in the, but in the man and his presidency, John Dowd had seen the tragic flaw. In the political back and forth, the evasions, the denials, the tweeting, the obscuring, the crying fake news, the indignation. Trump had one overriding problem that Dowd knew but could not bring himself to say to the president, you're a fucking liar. Thank you very much. Thanks.